Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by So Money Sports. Thanks for coming on the show. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by So Money Sports. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Jake. Looking forward to this. Thanks for having me on. No, it's it's my pleasure. I'm excited to talk some some hockey, some NFL betting, and then go through some of uh, some of the things that make you tick. So why don't you start with your background? Those who have been on Twitter as long as you have will realize that you've been a a big contributor in this in in that space. Tell us about how you how you started out. My story is not um, it's not very unique. Um, I started at a young age. Uh, sports was always my escape. I didn't grow up with a lot and didn't grow up in the best neighborhood. So playing and watching sports was my outlet. Um, early in high school, being a know-it-all kid, I thought it was easy to predict who was going to win. Um, at that time, obviously, I was too young for offshore accounts. But uh, we did have a government laundry, uh, government lottery that uh, provided sports betting. And at that time, you had to bet the three-team parlays. So I actually found a guy who was working there. Um, there was a kiosk outside the grocery store where, where I was working part-time. I was uh, 15, 14, 15 at the time. So uh, he was working at this kiosk, and he would actually let me fill out, uh, fill out and submit all those, those parlay cards. Um, in the grocery store where I was working, I was too young to handle cash. So, so they had me stacking baskets for customers and... I actually found an opportunity to um, walk down with them to their cars um, to help them unload their their shopping carts, and then uh, many of them let me uh, keep the keep the loonies that they had to um, use as like the deposit. So the loonies are are our dollar coins. We don't have dollar bills in, in Canada. We we have the coins, and then I, so they would give me the loonies as a as a thank you, and then I'm, I would pool all those loonies together, I'd go buy my parlay cards during my lunch break. And then spend the rest of the shift uh, taking taking bathroom breaks to call the to call the one eight one eight hundred numbers to uh, check the scores. Uh, so here I was, young kid, high school, playing three team parlay cards, paying the government juice, and then uh, we can imagine how that went. Uh, <laughs> so uh, from there um, into university, um, I had to make a change because um, I did want to bet seriously, but the way I was doing it was obviously not going to work and. As a high school kid, it wasn't a lot of money I was losing, but it was enough to make a difference when, when, you, when you're making, what, like $9, $9 $10 an hour. Uh, so I read constantly, surrounded myself with people with a ton of industry experience. Uh, there, were no, there was no Twitter at the time, so it was, all, it, it was all through the gambling forums. And then I was able to work with people, learn about modeling sports, and trying to um, discern any uh, mathematical edge that that I felt that I had. Take me back to. It sounds like you found an edge in the the supermarket game and a, a way <laughs> to get loonies, which is pretty cool. The three team parlays back then. I would imagine you were just doing it purely for fun and entertainment. I was, yeah. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, right? Like, I would I would watch the games. I would think that um, this team looks good. I like them. I'm a know it all, so I'm gonna bet them. And that's that's purely what it was. And did that ever change? Did you ever think, "Geez, I'm losing a lot of these three team parlays, and I got to figure out a way to stop losing"? Or was it always just a entertainment vehicle for you? Yeah. So, uh, so in, so in high school, I mean, like, I guess you, I guess you get to a point where you're just sitting there um, as, as as a young kid, just just in denial about what's actually happening. And then, um, so I'm I'm losing money, but not realizing that this is bad that I'm, that I'm losing my parlay cards. And then I had the realization actually in, um, in university where um, as you start making a little bit more, more money in life and you start betting a little bit more, 
and then you just sit there and it just hit me that maybe I'm not doing this the right way. Maybe like I shouldn't be betting three teams at a time. And then it just um it, it just went from there and that's where and that's where I was able to just kind of really be um really self self reflect and try to figure out that, you know, like am I am I wanting to do this for fun? Which is fine. Um am I wanting to do this for fun or do I want to make something out of this? So when was the point in your life when you thought you want to make something more out of it? Does not necessarily fully professional at that moment, but yeah. you figured that this could be a pathway for you. Um, so what actually happened was I was I was betting. Um, I don't I don't remember a specific game, and I don't know if it was any any period of time and, and any specific period of time. But um, I remember I took out. I, I had lost um, lost. It, it was like a ten dollar parlay card, and then um, and then I actually went and took out another fifty dollars to try to chase um, chase the the next day's games, and then and then I lost that as well. Um, I don't remember what the exact games were, but at that point it was around that time when I did that a few times um, where I lost, and then I would put down more money on the next day's games where I thought that, you know what, maybe I just don't know what I'm doing. That's a tough realization moment, though. That's that's one of the things when certainly a lot of people listening have probably gone through that when you realize I'm just getting killed here and I'm going to continue yeah. getting killed until until something changes. Exactly. And and I was lucky because, I mean, it wasn't a lot of money that I was losing, right? Like in the in, in the grand scheme of things, when you when you look at it now and when you're like looking back, it's it wasn't that much money that I lost, but... But at that time, it, it felt like a lot. So what what was the biggest change? Was it you just spent more time reading certain things and you were able to, to gather enough knowledge for it to become less recreational and more professional or semi-professional? Or what were some of the things that were allowing you to, to shift over from a constantly losing towards getting into the realm of winning? Right. So um, I I read a lot. Um, and like I mentioned, it was it was all gambling forums at that time. There was uh, back then there was um, there was tons of information, really good information that was that was on the gambling forums. If you took the time to sift through all the BS. Right. But um, but if you did that, there was there was a lot of information there. There was a lot of good, um, good, good content. We, we call it content now, but at that time there were like postings and like people sharing their thoughts. And um, it really, um, it really intrigued me to the sense that look at how these people are analyzing the games, how deep they go. And here I am looking at a team on TV thinking that they're good and I'm betting them. So, so there's, there's a huge disconnect there. And that's where um, that's, I just continued reading. Um, there was, there's research papers. There's, there's plenty of them out there now. Uh, but but back then um, you you really had to find it and I took the time to uh, really kind of um, look at what was out there, read, educate myself, and um, really try to uh, make a difference and to see if this is something that I can actually do or maybe I just need to keep it recreational. What did you find most difficult between the the handicapping side and watching games and understanding performance and understanding you know players and teams and whether they're good or bad versus the betting side which is more of the math and more of the understanding the system if it's a three-team parlay only system or if there's you know sides and totals and things like that that we know now did you have a did you have a one of those that was more difficult or did one of those come naturally to you in terms of watching the games um like it's it, it wasn't difficult to know who's who's playing well um and and like I mean like I've I've grown up around sports my whole life I've, I've played sports um, you can you can pick that up but what's difficult is yes your your eyes will tell you who's good but how does that translate into um, into betting into it it's not you you can watch a team and um, and you think they look good but when it comes time to betting on them are they minus four hundred good. Or are they minus 120 good, right? So, so, so that was the biggest uh, difficulty I had. That how how can I value these teams? And the way that I got over that was um, it was 
just surrounding myself with people that are more mathematically inclined than I am and, um, and kind of working with them to um, try to get my vision onto paper and onto my spreadsheets. Um, I'm, not, I'm never going to be the smartest guy in the room, but what I will be is the guy who can find the smartest people and, and cultivate mutually beneficial relationships with them. So take us through some of the handica- handicapping processes that you have. Obviously, you know, through the teenage years and university times, I would imagine compared to today, you're probably at an elementary level. Throughout the progression, what are some of the things you've been able to do to put in place to ensure that you're not only relying on your eyes, you're not only using, you know, core box score statistics and you're able to use other things and other metrics to be able to make better decisions? Sure. So um, now, um, and for the past few years, uh, the way I do it is um, I have my line, um, which which I which I line every game, and that is that is my foundation. Now, from from that line, um, there's there's a discrepancy between what number I have and what the what the posted, what what the posted line is. I also have a lot of um, old school element in me, and that's probably from from my earlier influences where um, I still try to look for, for an informational edge. Now, what I mean by that is that in the past, um, information wasn't as readily available as it is now. But like, I mean, I mean back then it was, it was impossible to get uh, lineup information in a, in, a, in a timely fashion. Now it's all about how quickly you can get actionable information and how quickly you can, you can account for it in your lines. So I have my foundation of my lines. And I'm also looking for any informational edge out there. This is where your reading, this is where your your relationships come in. And I'm a strong believer in that. Uh, Twitter is actually a great resource for that. So both in terms of the relationships you have with other bettors to see if there's any gaps in your modeling, in your discrepancy that you have, where you can work with other mathematical people to, um, to kind of try to bridge that. Or um, if there's you also need to be able to make strong connections with team beat writers. Um, there's so much information out there. And, and in today's world, um, you have an edge if you can get the information even a few seconds quicker. Even if it's a few seconds, you know who's going to be out of the lineup. You're able to quickly get down on it. Um, and that comes, from, that comes from reading. That comes from beat writers. So I always I, – I try to um, – I have my foundation, my baseline – and then I try to incorporate any informational advantages that I believe I have um, and whether I can incorporate that um, if it's if it's actionable information, whether I can incorporate that um, into my line either um, and and make and, and make adjustments on that basis. How do you feel about that informational approach and process now, given, like you said, we're dealing in seconds and sometimes even less, obviously the the major examples on major sports, if, if Brady's out, the Patriots line's going to shift dramatically, which is obvious. But then there's obviously college basketball and small school college football and international sports and WNBA and everything else. How Do, do you think that edge is going to be disappearing? Or do you think when you do bet it in that small window that now it's far easier to the book, for the bookmakers to, to notice that you're doing those types of things? How do you think that area is going to, to change over the next couple of years? I think that in bigger markets, um, you're actually seeing that, seeing that disappear. Um, I think that there is still there's still an, an advantage to that in the in the smaller markets, um, and this is where where another time, an, another instance where I'll go back to I'll go back to the relationships with people. It's impossible to sit there and monitor every single player every in every single sport while being able to get enough money down um, on that on that information. And that's why it's crucial to be able to work with people who are specialized in different areas where, um, where, 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 where you can quickly do that with. Um, so I, I think that depending on how your, how your infrastructure is, how strong your foundation is, if you are if as long as you're able to move quick enough, you'll be okay. But that window, as we move forward, um, it's just going to get smaller and smaller. There's just there's there's so many smart smarter people in the in the marketplace. the The market is so much more efficient now, um, and and that window is is shrinking every day. And it's just 
it's just becoming tougher and tougher for um, for me for for a lot of people out there. It's just it's 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 tough. It's really tough these days. What do you do uh, by way of an example in an NFL game when your power rating or your number or your 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 line that you've uh, generated on the game is minus three and the market's minus seven and a half? What process do you undertake from there? If it's that big of a difference, um, then that is something where I want to know um, why I'm getting that big of a difference. Um, whether it's um, it's the it's the market has has um, un, has under has has overvalued a certain team, um, and that's not being being accounted for in the line. Um, but all things being equal, if my line is minus three, I'm comfortable in, in that three. The market line is minus seven. Um, I'm gonna bet into that plus seven hard. And uh, and and because that's such a big a big advantage, I don't m- my lines don't usually differ that much. If it's if it's a four point difference with the two key numbers involved, um, I mean I'm that's probably going to be one of the biggest plays of my life. Is that happen once a season or once every decade? How often do those type of major discrepancies in a major sport like NFL, which as you said is very efficient, and those types of discrepancies aren't going to be common? Um, for me, that usually occurs um, maybe one or two times a year. Um, I'm trying to think back last year. Um, it didn't happen at all last year. Um, I believe the year before it happened. Um, but but it's very rare that, that my number is going to differ that much. How do you feel about adapting your number back towards the market or regressing back to the market if, if that's a, an efficient market like NFL, for example? taking your number and having a blended number that, that factors in all the different information that's already in the market price? Well, you have to respect the market too, right? So, I mean, at, at some point you have to, it, it gets tough with the, with the NFL because for a couple of reasons. So the, the sample size is so small in the, in, in the NFL, it's, it's easy to um, value something that, that you think is significant, but it just turns out to be irrelevant. Um, but you can't make those changes within a season, and you can't look at one game um, and 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 make a big shift. Um, the problem becomes that um, you have to respect the market as well. So in in those situations, um, you have to you have to trust your numbers, and then and then um, in the off season um, you have to see if. Um, if there's any like changes that you can make that when you're when when you're back testing that you're not getting um, that that you're not as successful as you think, um, but but in season you you can't make those changes unless if you're consistently off market that much or you're consistently not not beating the closing number then then you probably shouldn't be using that using whatever you're using um, within the season. How do you feel about NFL generally? Let's just say five years ago to today and then moving forward five years. A lot of people I hear now, smart people, saying that you know NFL sides at minus 110 is incredibly hard to beat or almost impossible to beat. Do you think that's generally true? And obviously there's other things you can do. You can bet earlier in the week. You can bet you know at the right numbers and things like that and, and line shop. But do you think generally NFL sides are going to be pretty, pretty difficult to even get towards break even generally across the board? Well, let me just say this. I am so impressed with people that can beat the NFL long term. Um, it is for me. It's the toughest. It's the most efficient market. Um, I had a. I had a. I actually had a losing year in the in the in the NFL last year, and I'm off to another an, another tough spot this year. Um, the thing with the NFL is that there's there's so many variables that um, that have an edge for a small period of time. And they become irrelevant quicker than than, than than other sports. That's due to the that's due to the sample size, and that's also due to just there's. I find that there's a lot more there. There's a lot smarter. There's a lot more smarter people that are betting in in the NFL, especially three four years ago. Um, I see a little shift away from that now, where um, a lot of my colleagues now they're not um, they're not so focused on the NFL as they were in the past. Um, and that goes back to just 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 how tough it is. Um, going forward, um, I know that um, in the last few years, I've actually started 
um, betting NFL earlier in the week. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that um, is the limits. Um, I have been lucky in that um, Canada's more more liberal with their with their with their betting laws, and also um, I I have a lot of colleagues, a lot of partners, a lot of friends where I can I am able to get money down at different offshore accounts where um, where I'm okay in in that sense. But um, I mean, I'm, you see, sometimes books are opening totals later later in the week. So that kind of defeats what what I'm trying to do betting bet, betting early in the week. So um, going forward, I think that NFL is just um, it's just going to get tougher, and it's it's incredibly tough right now. And I don't I don't see it um, I don't see it getting any better. If you don't mind, take us through the life cycle of an edge, and you you touched on it a little bit, but it seems like things are lasting you know a quarter half of an NFL season. Was that always the case? Do you remember looking back five, seven, ten years that edges would come and go that quickly? Or is it getting to a point now with how quickly information is shared, how quickly uh, different thoughts and opinions and ways to do things with the internet the way it is now and Twitter and the world of sharing information? Do you think that's going to continue to to get smaller and things might only be around for three or four or five NFL weeks? Definitely. I Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. So um, the last... Uh, the last few years, um, I've seen a shift where um, anything that you think that there's an edge, it's picked up on immediately. It just you just have a like a small period of time where um, where where you can move on it, and then it's it's just gone. There's just so much information out there. There's there's so much advanced stats. There's so many smart people that are looking to um, try to get the same edge that 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 you want in the in in the betting line so um yeah it's just it's just getting smaller and smaller and that and that information that that information just being so readily available out there um it's just making um it's just making it tougher and and the and the amount the period of time where you have that edge it's 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 just shrinking significantly you talked about working with other people and collaborating with others how do you typically go about doing that? Because I would imagine there's people listening and people out there betting sports who are doing a, a pretty good job themselves. They might be winning at one or two sports. They're, they're having a good time and they're building a bank. And they don't know necessarily how they should go about building their network. So what advice would you have for those who are looking at trying to grow their betting acumen and trying to get in contact with, with smart people in, in different sports? So the best way, um, we're... We're lucky now. So I, I talked about the disadvantages of, of, of the readily available information we have and how easily it is to transfer the information back and forth in terms of finding edges in the market. Now, conversely, the other side to that is that we're also lucky to be connected with people that um, easily connected with people that, that know what they're doing. Um, Twitter is an amazing resource. I've Built so many relationships through 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 Twitter. Um, what I would suggest, what I always recommend, is that reach out to people. I mean, um, the worst thing that's going to happen is that somebody doesn't get back to you, right? So I think that um, there's there's a lot of people out there that are serious. You you do have to just like the days of the online forums. You do have to kind of sift through all the bullshit, but. Um, but once you find people that that you can talk to, that you feel that know what they're doing, reach out to them. There's 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 tons of people that just want to make money on their plays, and they just want to help people, and that's and that's all there is to it. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it's something that people, certainly a younger generation, certainly people that are you know used to being behind a keyboard on Twitter, they may not necessarily feel as comfortable um, building those networks necessarily, or if they are, they're typically only online. So being able to do that, and, and certainly those people that have been doing it for decades now who are out there and available, it's really cool to be able to, to spend time with them either online or, or on the phone or whatever it might be, just l- learning from them. Yeah, and, and, and I always talk to talk to people that, uh, that, that my generation, our, our generation is the last generation that remembers what it's like to not have the internet, not have a smartphone, and also know and and live through today. So I mentioned that in when when I was working at the grocery store, like now when you want to check a score, you just pick up your phone and just 
check the score. Back then, I needed to find the break room. I need to go into the break room, find a phone, call the 1-800 number. I, I, I forget what the, what, the, what, what the actual number is, but, but the lady goes through all the scores of all, this, all the sports, and you sit there listening to her going through all the, <laughs> all the scores, right? And they, it's, it's, it's so different. So, I mean, there's disadvantages, but use the connections we have with people to be able to, um, to make things better for yourself. I want to ask you about bankroll management for a moment. And given you bet NFL and you bet hockey and, and probably a lot of other things, do you have one overall bankroll that covers all of your bets or do you split it up by sport? What are some of the principles on the, the bankroll management side that you focus on to make sure that you can be doing this for a long period of time? So I, I don't split it up per sport. Um, I have um, one, one bankroll. Um, so the, so the money is spread across everywhere. Um, and then, um, just, just because it's, it's not right or wrong. I don't think it's just that it's easier for me to manage and the way that I treat, treat my business that, um, if I've got money spread, spread everywhere, like there's, um, I may bet, um, NFL at Pinnacle and I may bet hockey at like, at, at, at like another book. Right. So it's, it just becomes too tedious and arduous to just sit and try to um, figure out that this money is part of this sports bankroll. So I treat it as one big bankroll and it's, and it's my business and I'm able to just um, bed, bed into it and not worry about what, what is allocated to what. So you use the word business there. You know, some people don't treat their bankroll like a business and they, they do things that, we all certainly recognize are, are negative or not worthwhile thinking longer term. How hard has it been for you to develop all of the different skills that are required to make sure your bank is going to last a long period of time? Yeah, so that's um, that's the toughest thing, right? Um, so you can have knowledge of sports. You can have a statistical modeling, strong, strong um, advantage there. But just like anything in life, if you don't know how to manage your money, you're done. So I, in terms of treating it as like a business, so, so for those who know me personally, um, they know that I don't enjoy the sweats. It's not, it's not entertainment. I don't have fun watching the games I bet. Um, I do have fun watching Canucks games. Like that's, my, that's like the only um, fun that I have in sports is like watching my Canucks. But although it has been fun lately, but um, so... I, I don't like the sweats. I don't enjoy watching these games that I've got money on. Um, it's it's such a... Um, it, it takes a mental and, and psychological toll, right? Like, I mean, you, you, can, you can sit there. Um, everything works out for you pregame. You've gotten the best of the number. You're, you're able to get money down um, that you need. And then at the end of the day, you're still at the mercy of elements that are beyond your control that are on the ice or on the field. So, I mean, we've all been through it, that emotional and psychological toll that it takes, but you just have to find an outlet that is not going to turn that psychological and emotional toll into a financial toll as well, right? So what I mean by that is that, um, look, at the end of the day, we've all wanted to chase that Hawaii game. We've all wanted to chase the Sunday night, Monday night game. But we just can't. We need to shut it down. So what I do personally is that, look, I had a tough Sunday. Um, I went 0-5, um, lost way too much money. So I'm just going to shut it down for the evening. I'm just going to turn everything off. Um, I'm just going to walk away. And I think that um, in, in my life and in my opinion, I think that um, getting to a point where you're able to just shut it down um, for any particular time is um, is what has worked for me. Um, others will say that um, well, if you're shutting it down, then you're then you're missing out on the on the edges that are still coming, and and you're not betting into those edges with which is not a sound mathematical strategy. I, I appreciate that, but um, it's not what works for me. What works for me is just completely walking away and just and, and just clearing my head yeah I, I being in an optimal uh 
peace of mind position is, is obviously better to take advantage of those. And one final question on this point, uh, obviously a bank's going to have variations and, and swings, you know, upswings and downswings. How do you generally go about dealing with those? And, and one more deeper point to that, with respect to recalculating, let's say your bank was $100 and it drops to $60. Do you drop your bets from, um, you know, $1 to $0.60 cents in those instances? Or how often do you look at your bank and, and recalculate for those purposes? So it depends. So if my bank dropped from $100 to $60, um, I want to know more about that $40 loss. Now, the way that you do that is that um, in those losses, were you getting unlucky or were you just making bad bets? So the best way to gauge that, in my opinion, is that of those $40 that you lost, how often did you beat that closing number? Um, how often did you, um, did you move away from, fr from your model? Now, if you're honestly able to say that you lost those $40 because um, a kid missed a free throw in the last second of a game or a team choked away a 17-point lead when they were dominating or a team blows a 4-1 lead late in the third period and there's a lot of bad luck involved there, if you can honestly say that, you don't change your betting. You, um, you, you continue to just ride out the... Right, right out the cold streak. If you lost that forty dollars because um, you're not beating the closing number, um, you've you varied too much from your from from your from your baseline. You've over adjusted on information that you thought was important, but it really shouldn't have been actionable in information. Um, then that then, then you need to look and probably either stop for a bit. Or, or just or or scale it down until you figure out what's going on. Um, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, um, um, and the people that follow me on Twitter will know this: that um, NHL unders um, actually um, I, I had my biggest edge there, um, and for a few years I was doing very well with my with my with with, with my NHL unders. And a couple of years ago, it changed. Um, now, it wasn't because I was losing on the NHL unders; it was because I failed to consistently beat the closing line on my on my unders, so I knew that that there was a big problem there. So I stopped I stopped betting totals um, just just mid season. I just stopped because I don't want to make any changes in the middle of the season. But I took it away and I really looked into what was happening in the in in the off season and what was happening that I found is that I just hadn't accounted enough for. Um, for a lot of the rule changes um, that that the that, that the NHL instituted, like the um, for example the um, face off in the in the in the offensive zone after uh, after an icing, you can't um, you can't make a line change, right? So little little things like that 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 are nuanced in the game, but they they provide a mathematical advantage if if you're able to tap into it. And I wasn't making that make that making that adjustment so we're at a point now where um i generally don't tend to bet nhl totals um i don't think that i have an edge there i know others that do and 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 they do well but um for me um i just had to walk away from that it's something that i'm working on um it's one of my projects that i have um that i'm kind of back testing in nhl totals and kind of seeing if i can get back into it but um, as of now, um, I have, I just, I've just stopped betting NHL totals. While we're on the topic of hockey, one of my previous guests was talking about his hockey betting, and and he was saying that that analytics, as applied to hockey, don't work as well as other sports, and sometimes there's an advantage by going against some of the the general analytics. From your perspective, from a hockey fan, hockey better, looking at. Uh, hockey betting markets moving forward. What use of analytics is is optimal, and do you think there's a do Do you agree in that sense that they're not as useful as they are in other sports? I can appreciate the point. I mean, uh, I mean, the basis of the point is that um, how much information is too much information, right? Um, I, I I can appreciate it. Um, I do I do tend to agree. Not so much that. Um, it's not as useful as other sports, but more so in, in the sense that 
um, there's more there's more of an informational advantage, I believe, that's that's built into hockey. Um, what I mean by that is that so I have I have my models of um, of individual players that for 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 every team. Now, once the once the lineups come out, once you have the line combinations, the starting goalies, um, you need to know um, you need to know the difference um, that taking a player out or um, not using a certain goalie is going to make in your model. So for, for example, there's, there's, there's certain players that just perform well playing with, with other players that, that, that can't be disputed. Now you're in the middle of a game and that team is struggling um, in that game. They're down two, three, nothing, whatever it is. And now the coach shuffles all the lines, right? So that, that changes everything that 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 you had pregame because now um, that particular player is not at the optimal level that you had in your models. So whereas that that doesn't happen in the NFL, for example, you have your QB rating, you have your you have your running back, wide wide receivers, all the all the skill positions, D line, O line, whatever it is. Um, if you in, if you were to take one of them out, if you were to not put one in the optimal situation, um, it's not going to be as as big of an impact as the NHL. And that is where um, you need to be constantly on top of on top of um, the information that's out there in terms of lineup changes, in terms of goalie changes. So, um, so in a roundabout way, I do agree with him. Um, in a sense, I'm just not fully there where I can say that it just doesn't matter completely, unequivocally, compared to other sports. I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I do appreciate that point. So, what about hockey generally as a betting option for those out there that don't do anything today with hockey? Do you think it's something worth considering? Do you think that it's a, it's an, a more of an emerging sport moving forward? Obviously, with the low scoring in, in comparison to NFL or or some of the other more high-scoring sports. There's those elements, you know, as exists with something like soccer today. But do you think that, that hockey is something people should be taking a look at because it might be something worthwhile to have in their uh, betting portfolio in the future? I, I think so. And the, and the reason I, I, I do think that is that it's, um, it's, it's a smaller market than, than, than the other sports out there. So if you're, if you're in a position where... Um, you you bet on hockey. You're able to um, find an edge with hockey. Theoretically, it should last you a little bit longer um, than than the other bigger market sports out there. So um, we 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 touched on the on, on the NFL how how efficient of a market the the NFL is. Um, hockey is not there yet. So there there is still opportunities in hockey, and I do think that. It is beneficial to add hockey as part of your betting betting portfolio. Um, again, if you're if if you know what you're doing in terms of what you're what, what you're looking for and, and your modeling. So, looking forward for yourself, have you thought generally about where you think you'll be at in five to ten years' time, or or at some point in the future? Obviously, things have changed pretty rapidly from the certainly from the government lottery three team parlay days, and as you aptly put, paying the p- playing the government juice. Do you think uh, do you think things will be similar in a sense in five years? Do you think it's going to be rapid evolution and the global markets will? consolidate around you know more standardized pricing what are some of the things that you'll be reacting to do you think in the next sort of five to ten years so on on a personal level um the last uh, few months i have so i spent most of my betting life um in the shadows and and like what i mean by that is that um i had um had my relationships with people with my colleagues, um, with other betters, just kind of off screen. So you 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 have my Twitter name, but you don't really know me. Um, and and of course the reason for that is that um, you need to be able to, as you have money spread out across all sports books, it's in my best interest and the interest of my partners um, for me not to be out there so much. 
what we're finding now and um, what what I've realized is that with the legalization in the states, you have um, a much bigger pool of money that is in these markets. And with that comes um, a lot of people that, um, how, how do I say this nicely? There's, 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 <laughs> I, know, I know what you're going to say. Yeah, so um, there's, there's a lot of unsavory characters that want to um, prey on other people, right? Um, and so that is just going to increase as we move forward. Um, I don't sell my plays. Um, the reason I put my plays out there in the first place is that um, for what, what I find is that it creates discussion. People ask me about my plays, um, either DM or text or whatever. And then, and it creates dialogue. Um, you find people that think like you or that have the same end goals as you and, and you grow together. Um, throughout, throughout this podcast, I think that um, if you can take away one big thing from what I've been saying, it's that how much I value relationships with people, right? So um, as I move forward, I want to be in a position um, where while the actual betting is getting tougher, um, where you're not able to get as much money down or you're not able to have as much of an edge, you can still have relationships with people that think like you and where you can expand into other, other areas of this industry where you can all still make money together um, on your plays, um, exchanging ideas, getting, um, working on different outs with each other. So I think that um, as I move forward, I think that coming out of the shadows a bit um, is, is where I see myself, where I can um, be, more, um, be, be more productive in this space, um, helping people and um, getting to where we all need to be together. Just generally on legalization, do you think net positive overall? It sounds like you're leaning in that direction, but uh, do you think we'll look back and say it was a it was a great thing overall, especially for more savvy professional betters? Oh, depends on the government shoes, right? <laughs> um, I think that um, if you're looking at it from a broader perspective, um, it's really tough to say. Um, I can see it going both ways. I'm kind of on the fence right now. Being able to get money down, being able to um, to kind of step away from from the stigma that is attached to what we do in in like the outside world and like the real life, um, as it becomes legalized, I think that that'll be better. Now, that's not to say that going forward, um, there could be situations where um, with the legalized betting that if you are profiled as a winning better, well, sorry, if you want to bet with us, you're going to have to pay 140, right? So that's that's something I'm kind of on the on on the fence on. Um, I think that we need to see where it goes. I can um, right now where I see the advantage is being able to um, get smart people who needed to be in the shadows, kind of getting them to step out into the light and being able to build relationships with those people because we don't know what the future is going to hold. But if you can make those relationships now, um, then you can kind of get through the future together. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. And, you know, that, that point you're talking about, minus 140 for the, the smart professional bettors, I hope bookmakers realize that the reason that they're smart professional bettors is because they can get around things like that and they'll find people who can – bet the minus 110 line or hopefully minus 105 lines uh, and they'll they'll work out partnerships. So one final point, you, you touched on it in the beginning and also just recently in one of your answers with making sure you surround yourself with experienced people and experts in their space. Uh, and one other thing you mentioned earlier on as well was around you read constantly and those are two things that are general themes when it comes to many professional bettors, many semi-professionals or those looking to make a, a side living or a full-time living doing this. Are there any other elements outside of those two things that strike you that either A, work for you or B, you see work for others? Because I'm sure there's many people that are looking for advice. They're not necessarily at a level yet where they 
are able to rely on their own skill set. What advice generally would you have for those types of people? It's 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 not just um, just about about uh, about reading. It's um it's 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 what you're reading. So 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 what helped me quite a bit is that um, reading research papers. There's 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 plenty of people out there, um, university students, um, um, that have, I think, a doctorate level or, or whatever that that have researched sports. They've researched analytics. Um, reading that, that is what is like that was what I found personally to really kind of open my mind in terms of um, what what I'm looking to do. So for for someone who's starting out. Yes, reading, surrounding yourself with smart people, um, it's there, but not not reading stuff from, um, I guess if we go back to the unsavory characters, but not 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 reading stuff from people that are going to tell you that Team X is 5-0 and against the spread on Mondays, right? But um, reading research papers, um, reading a more... A, a more analytically driven approach, um, that is what's really going to help you. And, um, and I mean, I, I did take, um, I, I don't have a statistical background per se, but um, I have been able to kind of learn enough over the years where um, I can be okay while asking for help from, from, um, from either uh, data scientists or, or or just generally people more more in, inclined to stats, where they can help me take what I have in my numbers to the next level. So I hope more and more people spend time putting that stuff out there. I know it's probably not a preference for a lot of them that they may not see the short term returns or the medium term returns. But I hope there's there's more, there's more content out there. There's better content. I saw something even this week. I think. Uh, uh, Rob Pozzola tweeted out from someone who wrote something pretty ridiculous that I think a couple of comments were around, is this even, is this true? Is this a fake? Like it was so ridiculous that it was obvious to most, but also uh, those early on in their gambling lives probably see it and, and read it as on face value. So I agree, the more we can get better content, better thoughts, better even opinions. It doesn't have to be, you know, perfectly true every single time. No, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And like, like, like there's no, there's no right formula in my opinion that if you do this at all times, then it's going to work for you. It just doesn't exist because our space and our landscape is just changing constantly, and we need to be able to constantly adapt to, adapt to 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 uh, to what what is out there. It's just, it's it's just it's just impossible to say that um, there's one certain element that's going to work every time. Right. And we need to be able to work with other people that have different mindsets, different backgrounds, different perspectives on the way that they that they view things. And that is when we can really grow and be really successful if if you're serious about doing this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there are foundational elements in in math and in betting that exist today. But I think there's certainly many best practices that are fluid and they'll continue to be and they evolve. So unless we evolve with them and, and help uh, generate those ideas together sometimes rather than being in the back pocket of some professional syndicates, then I think hopefully it's it's better for all. I want to thank you again for your time and, and all of your insights. It's been fun chatting. Uh, certainly many more topics we could cover. We'll have to save for another day. But uh, one final thing, do you want to just repeat your Twitter handle for those that are interested in reaching out and, and having a chat? Sure. My uh, Twitter handle is at soul. S O under underscore money and underscore sports. So, so underscore money underscore sports. Awesome. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Jake. Thanks for having me on.